From 8 News Now, a special presentation. America's Hidden History, honoring black history. Good evening, and thank you for joining us for tonight's special Hidden History. We're going to spend the next half hour introducing you to pivotal figures that wrote our city's African-American history. And we're bringing it all to you from the Obsidian and Neon exhibit here at the Nevada State Museum. The exhibit is a photo narrative of large-scale black and white photography. Its full name, Obsidian and Neon, celebrating black life and identity in Las Vegas. It's an exploration and celebration of community members who are cultivating black life in Las Vegas. From our city's history to our state, Nevada was the first state to ratify the 15th Amendment. On March 1st, 1869, Nevada granted African American men the right to vote. Shaquilla Alvarenga looks at the fight for equality. My name's Yvette Williams, and I'm chair of the Clark County Black Caucus. So they say the home is your, your home is your castle. This is my peace place. I mean, I, I really is. Yvette Williams is a community advocate. She's a fighter for equality, justice, and access to opportunity. Now she's empowering others to do the same. The only way that we have a say is by voting. This year will mark the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. Here in Nevada, we were the first to ratify, and that uh, happened on uh, March 1st of uh, 1869. Williams works with local black student unions to increase voter turnout. Today we're going to be uh, passing out voter registration cards, and we really would like for students um, who are capable to vote to register. At Liberty High School, a handful of students are inspiring change. I know as a youth, I feel like I don't have a voice sometimes, and I feel like voting is a great way to express your voice. I think it's important to vote so I can to see someone in office that I picked that might represent me and that cares about me and my community. If all our young people actually went out and vote, they could tip the outcome of, a, of every elected person because they total about 42,000 in Nevada that are eligible that are not voting. That's huge. Williams hopes education will encourage everyone to use their voice. I'm inspired by them and motivated by them. That's why I do what I do, really. It's because of them. Why not use our voice and use our vote, which has been wanted for so long and been fought for. Shaquilla Albarenga, 8 News Now. As we look at the history here in the museum, we also want to pay tribute to some of the lesser known aspects of the story, in particular, the barber trade. Yeah, Sally Jaramillo introduces us to Royal Byron, who actually brought the first barber school to Las Vegas a little over 10 years ago. <laughs> For many, a barber is simply a person who cuts hair. For others, it's a dream come true. Everything that changed my life or career, I can be proud of. So Royal Byron is the owner of Nevada's first barber school. Growing up, he had many disadvantages, but that wasn't going to stop him from breaking the many stereotypes that were tossed his way. His love for cutting hair pushed him to become Nevada's first licensed barber instructor. At that time, which was 95, the instructor test didn't exist. So knowing that the instructor test didn't exist, uh, they had to compile a test together. So me being the first instructor to take the test, I set the pace for what is right, what is wrong, as far as qualifying someone to actually do this job. But the challenges simply didn't stop there. I heard all those adversaries to, if a person is saying what I was trying to do, uh, they're not going to let a black man do that type of job, or they wasn't going to allow no school here, period. Through patience, he was reminded one day he will open the school of his dreams and only look forward, no longer backwards. The classroom is the sacred ground to what happens in here stays in here. This is a place that has a revolving door for people so they can get that on-hands experience. Today, he gives students the opportunity to ask for help when they need it and encourages them to be polite, practice safety, and sanitation. Place it on the counter, loosen the chair cloth from around the neck, one hand, voila. If he didn't take this serious, I'd feel like his students wouldn't take this serious. Mr. Byron, thank you for um, having me as a student, you gave me some life lessons as well as skills to go out and provide a good service for the public and to protect them and keep it sanitary and just be a real barber. My biggest goal and legacy is to make sure uh, one of my loved ones will be able to or the instructors that I trained will have the infrastructure to keep this school going. Sally Jaramillo, 8 News Now.
Royal Byron also opened up the Art of Barbers that's located on Vegas Drive in Decatur. He's also looking to work with veterans and the school district to give those with financial difficulties haircuts. Turning to sports and specifically ice hockey. The first black NHL hockey player was named Willie O'Ree. He suited up for the Boston Bruins against the Montreal Canadiens January 18th, 1958. But the history begins way before that. The first reports of hockey being played by black players was recorded in 1815, south of Halifax, Nova Scotia. That was home to four black families who moved there from the Chesapeake Bay area with a total of 15 children. Years later, in the same region, we see the first recorded mention of all black hockey teams playing in the Colored Hockey League of the Maritimes. It existed until the mid 1920s. History tells us that sports can lead the way in bringing us all together. Well, Ron Futrell now takes a look at what the NHL is doing to make that happen. Now, hockey is seen primarily as a white sport. Now, with most of the athletes from Canada and Eastern Europe, that's understandable. Can we get you a cage? Local NHL player Darren Banks, he was born in Toronto, and he just wanted to play. At first, when I was younger, I didn't understand the race thing. You know, you know, it's like I'm skating, I'm the only black kid on the ice, but I didn't think that way. You know, until some kid would say something to me, and I'm like, you know, didn't really get it, but I was like, whatever, you know. Whatever, we're hockey players. Yeah, so we're out here having fun. And then a neighbor uh, influenced my parents to let me play hockey. Darren feels that hockey is making progress to integrate, and it starts with the youth. He's making new progress. I mean, I've actually done the Clark Park uh, little hockey thing in Detroit where it's all the young youth black kids in the area, Hispanic kids playing, and to see that many kids coming out and playing, the kids who've never been exposed to hockey, now they couldn't afford, you know, equipment, obviously, and then watch kids excel from that program, and, like, be able to skate. You know, again, when I was younger, I was the only black kid on the ice. There wasn't another black kid anywhere, and in, until I got older, you know, I didn't really watch the NHL. I watched, I watched players, but then I, the first, I think the first black player I'd seen play was Grant Fuhrer. Now these days, Banks is an executive casino host at the D, downtown Las Vegas. Now the owner of the hotel casino, Derek Stevens, has made it a point to expand hockey's reach by making youth programs more available to young people in the Valley. I mean, he'd love to see every kid in the world play hockey, and I kind of, you know, I pushed him a little bit into the hockey. Let's get into the hockey. Let's get into the hockey. And we talked about the nights before they even came here. I said, Derek, the hockey team's coming here. Like, I could see the writing on the wall. Hockey NHL was coming to Las Vegas. Nothing was going to stop it. The Golden Knights won it. Oh, and another point with Banks. He was a fighter in the NHL. Banks takes that first shot. If there were ever racial slurs, well, he knew how to take care of himself. I was a big kid. I was a physical player, and if you were going to come after me with racism, it's not hard for me to go after you. You know, and that was the way I could rebel to it a lot easier. So a lot of kids didn't really say a lot to me. A few did, and you make them pay later. And Banks is escorted to the dressing room. In Las Vegas, I'm Ron Futrell reporting. Still ahead on our Hidden History special, from desegregation to the improvement of education. Bianca Holman will introduce us to a woman who's made it her life's work to help students create a better future. And teaching through song, one group's mission to keep the past alive through music. Welcome back to America's Hidden History, an 8 News Now special presentation. We're here at the Nevada State Museum, taking a closer look at our state's hidden history. You know, schools were not desegregated until just over 50 years ago. So I want you to meet one woman who's dedicated her life to providing opportunities for all children through education. Dr. Beverly Mathis loves her students. Good to see you guys. She's been a teacher, an assistant principal, a principal, and now she is the school. There's a scripture that says that you, you are blessed beyond and above, that, that you can even think of, that you can even imagine. More than 900 children in southwest Las Vegas attend Dr. Beverly Sue Mathis Elementary School, home of the Mustangs, which opened its doors in 2017. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and knowing that these, that, that even after I'm gone, there will be children after children after children going through these doors, being educated in this magical place. It's so rare that kids get to see a celebrity in real life. The journey to have her name on a building started as a child. Mathis and her siblings used to play school. She would always be the teacher. She realized knowledge was the key to a new opportunity. Wall of Fame. Yes. It is from Trenton, Tennessee. 
that's in West Tennessee, to Las Vegas, Nevada. Mathis says her parents, who only had a second and third grade education, taught her integrity and persistence, values she used when overcoming challenges like being part of the first integrated class of her local high school. Those are the same values she says her and her husband taught their daughters, Tia and Ashley, who nominated her as a Clark County School namesake. You can see the light in the kids' eyes um, of, of, our, of our African American students who look at her and they're like, you know what? That's pretty cool. Mathis is a living example for her students, showing them that regardless of where you start, education can be a tool that helps you achieve your dreams. Her legacy will last for years to come, as it's supported by passionate educators, staff, engaged parents, and motivated youth. I want people to say, Dr. Mathis put children first. That, thank you. I, I love it. I love it. Put kids first. Dr. Mathis continues her passion for education by serving as the Vice President of Early Learning, Literacy and Family Engagement for the Public Education Foundation. A local school celebrated the 25th anniversary of Martin Luther King Day with a garden. The project took three years to put together at Reese Elementary with the help from a nonprofit, Green Our Planet. It is amazing. I mean, for me, a Monday, three-day holiday, Monday morning, and uh, people just came out here and really uh, put their best foot forward, and uh, it just goes to prove that when we set something up here at Reese Elementary, we get it done. Coming up, 400 years in the making. We take a look at a city's history that holds centuries of African-American history. Plus, raising hymns, what a group is doing to keep their history alive through song. Welcome back to America's Hidden History. An 8 News Now special presentation. And welcome back to our Hidden History special. We turn now to a place with 400 years of achievement, inventions, and history. All of that is embodied at Fort Monroe in Virginia, a place that commemorates and celebrates African American history. If these shores could talk, the stories would be as endless as the drops in the ocean. Looking at this mark reminds me of 25 years of struggle. 25 years to tell the true story of those first Africans. But for Hampton native Calvin Pearson, it all ties back to one moment in history. Arrived right here at Point Comfort. Today is Fort Monroe. A late August day in 1619 when the first enslaved Africans taken from Angola were brought here. Two of those first Africans were Isabella and Antony. They became servants in the household of Captain William Tucker. And in 1623, they gave birth to the first documented African child born in English-occupied North America. And 400 years later, on a similar August day, their ancestors came together to remember. Not just about us, it's American history. Randall Tucker and his family grew up hearing about their roots. And for the 400th commemoration of that first landing in Virginia, they invited the public to honor with them. And we know without doubt our ancestors are very proud of us because we are standing on their shoulders for all the years that we invested in putting this together. It was just, it, it was worth every bit of it. A story and a legacy 400 years in the making. Remembering the painful past they say can help heal our country and move toward a better future. This needs to go out to the world so the world can see what took place today. An old art form has taken a new life in Augusta, Georgia. The group, the Disciples of Praise, at the Greater Mount Canaan Missionary Baptist Church are doing what's called Raising Hymns. It's a form of song known as call and response that dates back to slavery. Back in the slavery time, quite naturally, they didn't want them to know how to read, so they couldn't read. But, but as it went older and older, you may have had the preacher or some designated one that, you know, would read it. Or they may not then have a one book. The hymns fall into categories of standard, common metered, and long. As instruments have increased in popularity during services, this form of music has seen a significant decrease in many churches. While raising hymns has become a dying art, the Disciples of Praise is using it to keep history alive. They travel to different churches upon request. Ahead, one woman who paved the path for other black women to be TV anchors. How her dream became became a legacy in the field of meteorology. Welcome back to America's Hidden History, an 8 News Now special presentation. Welcome back. And now we honor June Bacon. She became the first African-American woman to be a meteorologist on the air. Here's Lisa Teachman with her story. I'm June Bacon-Bercy, meteorologist from the National 
Secret Service. She had a dream that became a legacy. She always loved the atmosphere. Uh, we grew up with weather balloons. June Bacon Bursey would leave her home in Wichita to earn her master's degree at UCLA. My mom was very focused on making sure we knew our roots. Her daughter says her heritage was just as important as the future she was paving for meteorologists and women of color. From her perspective, she had the skills and the, and the clear path from a, an, an intellectual uh, curiosity to uh, pursue a path that uh, had not um, been paid before. Already cold air is still barreling down in the midsection of our country. She'd become the first woman, an African American, to be awarded the American Meteorological Society Seal of Approval for Excellence in Television Weathercasting. Weekend Weather with June Bacon Bercy bears the seal of approval of the American Meteorological Society. Her career included working at NOAA, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, and the National Weather Service, all at a time when men greatly outweighed women in scientific fields. She was obviously the woman, only woman in most of her classes. She faced, I, I think, more uh, issues with her gender than her race. When she was called a weather girl, she, she would smile and, and say how, uh, you know, how proud she was to you know, be a meteorologist. Advancing the science of meteorology was a big goal of June's, particularly with women. That's what drew her to a network game show, winning $64,000. That was her vision of being able to start a scholarship for women in meteorology. Leaving a legacy that paved the way for so many to follow. In Wichita, Chief Meteorologist Lisa Teachman for Hidden History. Now back to the world of sports and another major figure who changed the game of football forever. Johnny Brighter was a star player at Drake University. In 1951, he suffered from devastating blows to the face during a football game against Oklahoma A&M University, now known as Oklahoma State. At the time, face masks were not required in college football. It soon became mandatory after Bright made national news. Oklahoma State University gave the Bright family a formal apology two decades after he passed away, nearly 55 years after the incident happened. Up next, bringing back the history of the American Revolution. We'll tell you how an exhibit is trying to let others understand what African Americans went through in the Revolutionary War. Welcome back. It's crucial to protect and conserve the environment. The groundwork started back in the 1800s by African American soldiers. Our national parks are home to some of the most iconic views in the whole world. Up near Yosemite was a group called the Buffalo Soldiers. They are considered the first park rangers in the world. Their name was given to them by Native Americans. The Buffalo Soldiers left their mark in the area of conservation. We didn't just come along after this was set up. We were part of the setting up. We were part of the building of the, this idea. So basically they were providing a presence of discipline, a presence of authority, so that people knew that the park was under the command of these forces. The National Parks and Park Rangers was established in 1916. Gone but never forgotten. The Forgotten Soldier exhibit in Yorktown, Virginia, brings back the history of those who sacrificed their lives during the Revolutionary War. Paintings and rare documents highlight what the experience was for African Americans and the decisions they had to make. One of the curators of the exhibit says they're trying to teach visitors more than just the understanding of the American Revolution. We want our visitor to walk out of this gallery and take this new toolkit, this new idea of shifting the gaze into the permanent gallery, into other museums and into their everyday life. We want our visitors to learn how to see things that they hadn't seen before, to look beyond the known and look into the unknown and, and hopefully um, have a more complete understanding of our past. The Forgotten Soldier exhibit in Yorktown, Virginia is open until March. Well, that finishes our Hidden History special right here on Channel 8. For more stories on black history and the impact from major figures, go to 8newsnow.com. For Bianca Holman and Alex Backus, I'm John Langler. Thank you for joining us.